In late October 1979, two Barbera killers had teamed up to fulfill a prison time fantasy to kidnap, rape, torture and kill a girl for each teenage year. For two months, the duo hunted roads and beaches, looking for victims who matched their demented fantasy. They almost met their goal, killing five young girls, ages ranging between 13 to 18. This is their story. In 1978, Lawrence Sigmund Bittaker, age 38, and Roy L. Norris, age 30, met while in the California State Prison. Norris was labelled a mentally disordered sex offender and previously spent four years at a state mental institution. Once released, he raped again and returned to prison. Bittaker spent most of his adult life behind bars for various offences. As their friendship grew, so did their fantasies of raping and murdering teenage girls. After their release from prison, they paired up, transformed Bittaker's 1977 GMC van into what they nicknamed Murder Mac and began their kidnap, torture and killing spree of young girls. As is characteristic of psychopaths, the pain inflicted on their victims grew more vicious with each new victim. The van had its advantages, there were no side windows to worry about and there was a large sliding door on the passenger side. If their intended victims burned the offer for a ride, Bittaker reasoned they could pull up real close, not have to open the doors all the way to snatch someone from the sidewalk. They cruised up and down the Pacific Coast Highway, stopping at beaches, flirting with girls, and often took their photos. On June 24, 1979, in Redondo Beach, Cindy Schaefer, age 16, was walking to her grandmother's house after attending a church program. Bittaker and Norris pulled up next to her in the murder mac and tried to entice her to go for a ride. Her attempts to ignore the two failed. She was forced into the van and taken to a pre-selected spot in the mountains. They parked out of sight from the highway. The men smoked grass and questioned Schaefer about her family until they tired of the routine and ordered her to strip. Bittaker left the van for an hour or so, giving Norris some privacy. Then he came back to take his turn. In custody, months later, each accused each other of insisting that Schaefer die. Norris first tried to strangle Schaefer, but he bungled the job. He left to vomit in the weeds. When he returned, Norris said Bittaker was choking Schaefer, but her body was still jerking, alive to some degree, breathing or trying to breathe. Bittaker then handed Norris a wire coat hanger and they twisted around her neck, tightening the makeshift garrote with vice grip pliers. Norris recalled that Schaefer convulsed for 15 seconds or so, and then that was it. She just died. Wrapping the body in a plastic shower curtain, Bittaker and Norris drove back along the road until they found a deep canyon. They lifted Schaefer's body from the van and heaved it into the chasm. Bittaker said the desert scavengers would clean up after them. It had been almost perfect. The exhausted friends agreed, but there was something missing. Next time, they would keep a trophy of the hunt. Bittaker and Norris went hunting again on July the 8th, 1979. In early afternoon, they saw a likely prospect, thumbing rides along Pacific Coast Highway. But the driver of the white convertible pulled in ahead of them and plucked her from the roadside. Norris grumbled over their bad luck, but Bittaker cancelled patience. They would follow the convertible for a while and see where the hitchhiker was dropped off. Their patience was soon rewarded. The convertible's driver signaled to an exit ramp ahead, breaking first to deposit her passenger on the berm. She stuck a thumb out, waiting for the next ride. Meanwhile, Norris left Murder Max's passenger seat and threw himself under the raised bed in the back. It was a change in strategy to make the van appear less threatening. It worked. Andrew Hall was 18 and thankful for the ride. She introduced herself to Bittaker as he pulled back into the traffic. Briefly accepting his offer of a cold drink, Hall went to fetch it from a cooler in the rear of the van, choosing a soda and turning back towards her seat. Norris lunged from hiding then and swept her legs out from under her. More grappling on the floor of Murder Mac, more blaring music from the radio as Bittaker drove on. Hall fought for her life, but Norris was too strong twisting an arm behind her back until she finally surrendered. The submission enabled Norris to bind her wrists and ankles and cover her mouth with tape. 
There was no time for small talk with their second victim. They repeatedly raped her by turns. When both of them were tired, Bittaker loaded his Polaroid camera, dragged Hall from the van, and sent Norris on a beer run down the mountain to a small roadside convenience store. When Norris returned, he found Bittaker alone, smiling over photos of Andrea Hall, her face contorted by fear. He told me that he was going to kill her, Norris later informed police. He wanted to see what her argument would be for staying alive. He said that she didn't put up much of an argument. Bittaker told Norris that he had stabbed Hall twice with an ice pick, once in each ear, but he had to struggle with her when she refused to die. When the murder was finished, Bittaker said he pitched her off a cliff. Bittaker and Norris made their third fray on Labor Day, September the 3rd. Cruising through Hermosa Beach, they spotted two girls seated on the bench at a bus stop where Pier Avenue met Pacific Coast Highway. 15-year-old Jackie Gilliam and 13-year-old Leah Lamp weren't waiting for the bus, but they seemed happy to accept a ride with no special destination in mind. Bittaker and Norris later told police the girls were also happy to accept Larry's offer to smoke a joint. Lighting up, he passed the joint around and told his passengers that he was heading for the beach. Jackie and Leah challenged him moments later as Bittaker turned away from the ocean and started driving northward, but he stalled them with excuses, claiming he merely wanted to find a safe place to park while they got high. The girls protested when Bittaker parked near a suburban tennis court. Leah started to open the door, but Norris was faster, swinging a sword off baseball bat against a skull. A fierce struggle ensued. Bittaker waded in to help Norris, finally subduing the teenagers and trussing them with duct tape. Only when they were secured and silenced did he notice several tennis players watching from nearby courts. Worried that someone might call the police, Bittaker gunned the van and sped away towards his hideout in the San Gabriel Mountains. But no one called the police. The witnesses returned to the tennis games, dismissing the strange incident. Bittaker and Norris kept their latest hostages alive for nearly two days. They kept an audio tape of their rape and torture. Among other things, the tape captured Norris raping Jackie Gilliam, demanding that she play the role of the cousin who was the object of some of his sexual fantasies. Tired of the game and running dangerously late for work, Bittaker repeated his trick with the ice pick, stabbing Gilliam in both ears. As with Andrea Hall, he made a scream but failed to kill her, so the rapists took turns strangling Jackie to death. Afterwards, they turned on Lamp, Bittaker squeezing her throat while Norris pounded her head seven times with a sledgehammer. They pitched their victims off a cliff, with the ice pick still embedded in Jackie Gilliam's skull. The next month was nerve-wracking for Bittaker and Norris, worried that police might come for them at any moment. Bittaker found a new apartment in Burbank, while Norris remained with his mother. The killers began to relax as weeks passed without any sign of police attention. The pair went hunting again on Halloween night, deviating from their beach routine to prowl the residential streets of the Sunland and Tijunda district in the San Fernando Valley. They spotted 16-year-old Lynette Ledford hitchhiking and offered her a ride. She happily accepted, and within five minutes, Norris wrestled her to murder Max floor. Victaker chose not to waste time driving to the mountains. They could rape and torture Ledford just as well, he reasoned, while they drove around the suburbs of Los Angeles. Norris took the driver's seat while Big Taker turned on the tape recorder and went to work on their captive. The tape recorded him slapping her, demanding, Say something, girl. What do you want me to say, she responds. The slapping continues, interspersed with cries of pain. Frustrated, Big Taker asks Ledford, You can scream louder than that, can't you? Ledford tries to accommodate him, but Big Taker wants more. Soon he goes to work with the vice grip pliers. Scream, baby, he urges. Next, Norris's voice is heard. Make noise there, girl, he orders. Go ahead and scream, or I'll make you scream. I'll scream if you stop hitting me, Ledford sobs, when Norris starts striking her elbow with a hammer. Norris swings the hammer 25 times while he chants mindlessly, Keep it up, girl. Keep it up. Scream till I say stop. He take a park van and prepared for the kill. I got a section of coat hanger, he later told police, and wrapped it around her throat and tied it up with the pliers. Emboldened, they thought it would be amusing to see what happened if they dumped their victim on someone's front lawn. They chose a yard at random in Hermosa Beach and loaded Ledford's corpse into a bed of ivy. The corpse was discovered the next morning. 
the find shocked Los Angeles since it only came days after the arrest of the Hillside Strangler. Norris was the murderous pair's downfall. He bragged to an old prison friend about his crime spree. The friend tipped off police, and the story sounded much like that of the victim, Shirley Sanders. On September 30th, Shirley Sanders managed to escape from two men who used chemical mace on her, then raped her inside a van. Police interviewed her again, this time armed with pictures, and Sanders was able to identify the van and Norris and Big Taker as her attackers. The two were arrested for unrelated crimes and held without bail for violating their probations. During an interrogation, Norris began omitting details about the pair's murderous activities and he pointed the finger at Bittaker for being the one who killed their victims. Norris worked out a deal with authorities in exchange for his testimony against Bittaker, as well as showing police where they hid the bodies of their victims. Overall, police found over 500 photos of teenage girls, 19 of which were listed as missing. But Norris clammed up and would only tell investigators what happened to five of the 19 missing girls. During Bittaker's and Norris's trial, the disturbing pictures of their crimes and tape recording of Lynette Ledford's final painful hours were shared with the jury. The impact was substantial. Big Taker was sentenced to death and the judge included an extra 199 year life sentence just in case his death sentence was ever commuted to life. Norris was given 45 years to life for his cooperation in the investigation. In 2009, Norris was denied parole for an additional 10 years.